Vyapritesh Vindriyesh Vatma Vyapariva Vivekinam Drishyate Breshu Dhavatsu Dhavanivyata Sashi Vyapriteshu, while functioning. Indriyeshu, the sense organs. Atma, the self. Vyapari, active. Iva, like. Avivekinang, for non-discriminating people. Drishyate, is seen. Abreshu, clouds. Dhavatsu, when moving. Dhavan, running. Iva, like. Yata, just as. Shashi, the moon. Just like the moon appears to be running when the clouds move in the sky, to the non-discriminating people, the Atman is seen to be active when it is observed through the functions of the sense organs. Namaste. So this verse is very interesting because it calls up the relativity of superimposition. In superimposition, adhyasa, you have two dissimilar things layered on top of one another huh? so that what is looks like something else. The classic example is the snake and the rope, or the rope and the snake. Which do you prefer? Because they're both superimposed on each other. Right? The substrate is the rope. That's the reality. And then the snake is superimposed on it by virtue of the common factor of form, shape. The way the rope, you know, kind of resembles a snake in form, then the mind imagines or remembers, actually, a snake and projects it on top of that, overlays it, huh? like, you know, uh, compositing on video. And then you think, that's a snake, and you react accordingly. However... Actually, what's happening is <laughs> you're ignorant. This is called ignorance, when you don't know what is so. So, as soon as someone brings a light, then it's revealed the substrate is actually a rope. And just receiving that knowledge that the what I thought was a snake is actually just a rope, immediately ends the fear due to the ignorance of superimposition. So, in the same way, in this example, is a wonderful example in this verse, talking about how the moon appears to move in the sky because the clouds are moving. Huh? But because the moon is the substrate, the moon is more persistent than the clouds by a large factor. So we tend to see the moon moving. See, because reflection always reverses right and left, right? If you look in a mirror, similarly, the reflection of consciousness in the mind and intelligence appears to reverse cause and effect, background and foreground. So to, to us, relatively, the moon appears to be moving, although we may even know consciously that it's the other way around. Let's take a look at our good old chart, the four primary states of consciousness. Their views, now darshan, how you see when you're in that state, and the appropriate yogas 
and the chakras that facilitate those states. So in the state of Jagrat, we have what's called Dvaitavada, the view that duality is real. The world seems to be real and full of all kinds of objects and cause and effect and so on. The body appears to be the self. Huh? I am this body. I am the possessor of all things related to this body. I am the enjoyer of these senses, the knower of this mind, and so on. And as you can see in the chart, the appropriate yoga, karma yoga. Why? Because karma yoga is work in the world as service to the deity. Now, where is the deity? The first three chakras have a different kind of intelligence. They just know, oh, here is something. I have to do this to it. <laughs> Work, in other words, cause and effect. That's all well and good for the physical maintenance of the body. And in the beginning of spiritual life, accumulation of good karma to bring prosperity and good health and good luck later on when it's time for realization. So anyway, we all start out in Jagrat, where the center of gravity of our model of reality is based on Jagrat consciousness, thinking that the world is real, thinking that the senses are true. Although the senses are all like the rope and the snake, huh? No, there's the reality, which is the rope. And then there are the qualities that our senses project on them. Uh, through superimposition. If I'm perceiving something through my visual sense, it will have certain attributes based on vision, color, shape, form, distance, perspective, you know, all that stuff. If I'm hearing a phenomenon, it will have the qualities of hearing, pitch, tone, loudness, etc., and so on with the other senses as well. So each sense projects its own set of qualities on the environment. And that narrow chunk of the spectrum is what we see or what we perceive. But actually, the reality is much more, as science has revealed, uh, than we can perceive through our senses without, you know, extra added technology. <laughs> anyway, the next step is when someone gets religion. Okay, I've been serving this God. I've been serving Dharma. I've been doing all this good work. I've been avoiding sinful activities, practicing yoga, you know, meditation. Now what's next? Worship. Worship means, based on the faith that there is something divine. To worship that divine in some way or other, in some form or other, in some concept or other, as a regular duty enjoined by the scriptures. See, this is worship on the level of karma yoga. But what happens because of the natural tendency of the mind when we associate with the idea of a deity, over time we will tend to identify with that idea or ideal. And there has been an enormous amount of discussion in the history of the world about what is the ideal deity. Well, we'll just cut to the chase and say that it's Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva, and their consorts, plus Brahman, the self. These are the ideals. And this is what the Vedas ultimately say are the objects of our worship, our sacrifice. So we perform sacrifice according to Vedic injunction. And not only do we become materially successful and protected and wise, 
but we also develop faith in an unseen deity, which by inference must exist in order for the world to exist. So that, I'm going to cut to the chase, is the primary argument for theism. There must be some kind of an intelligent agent to create this reality, this world. I mean, the more you look into it, the more amazing and inexplicable it is. Isn't it? So one develops faith, and on that faith, one develops love. One develops love for the one whose praises one hears regularly. <laughs> it's a hard concept to express in English. But in Sanskrit, it's simply Bhagavat Bhakti. So, <laughs> you know, it's the linguistic problem, the cultural problem is difficult because the whole context of the Vedas gives the meaning to these terms. And of course, that context doesn't exist in Western language and culture. So anyway, we do our best. <laughs> Bhagavad Bhakti is devotional service. And it is not done with the body, the three lower chakras. It is done with the heart and words. So whatever is the worshipable object of one's heart, that spontaneous attraction to which engenders ecstasy and love, and then expressing that in words, honestly, directly, comprehensively, purely, huh? and, and so on for a long time, imbues that being with the qualities of the God, the deity whom he worships. These are big ideas. <laughs> and like I said, English is not the best language to express them in. It's awkward. So, you know, we're talking like, you ever hear Spanish people talking Spanish? Why do they talk so fast? I asked one, some, one time, and I said, because in Spanish, to say things, you have to use so many little words. <laughs> so they have to talk really fast to keep up with their thinking. Well, the same is true. If you start to think in Sanskrit, if your perceptual or conceptual background is based and rooted in Sanskrit, you're going to look at things a certain way. And by exposure to this bhakti culture, which is expressed in the Puranas, Puranas are scriptures based on the Vedic model, expressing or enlarging or even creating the background and the stories of these deities. So they are meant to encourage bhakti. Well, what happens after some time? Bhakti matures, and it spontaneously turns into meditation. What is meditation? In yoga, after yama, niyama, asana, and pranayama, then the four higher stages are pratyahara, withdrawal of the mind from the senses, dharana, concentration, dhyana, meditation, and samadhi. Now, in my experience, when bhakti reaches its pinnacle, its height, these take place automatically. And then, again, spontaneously, one begins the process of neti-neti, because one sees the objects of the world and the phenomena of the world and says, this is not it. This is not my God. This is not my Lord. See, this is not what I consider the absolute, the creator. See, the identity or the personality or the soul of the material universe. Uh, this is not it. This is not it. Whatever I encounter, whatever I experience is not it. So where is it? Where is God? And one comes to the final conclusion 
that God is like the snake, something that we project based on what we need to balance and ground and compensate for the qualities in our life. And that's okay. That's all right. Shankaracharya encouraged the elaborate worship of several different deities and just even established temples and whole, you know, rules of worship and so on. I mean, Shankaracharya was very pro-bhakti. Why? Not that he was compromising, not that he was saying, uh, no, actually, you can achieve liberation through worship of form. No, no he's never going to say that. <laughs> But what he's saying is that this kind of worship can help purify us of the upadis, the body, the mind, the possessions, the environment, the relationships, all the stuff that we think is I and mine. And when we reach the end of that, that is the great void. See? So the Buddha was right, you know, on that level, see, this is the relativity of consciousness. That from the guy in Jagrat, everything else looks like a dream. And from the point of view of bhakti in Svapna consciousness, you're in the dream, you are an active agent in the dream. Huh? And to you, everything that is not aligned with your faith looks like illusion and ignorance. <laughs> but then when bhakti matures, you get to see what is actually ignorance, including the dreams of bhakti, and reject that too. Then you're in the void. This is the dark night of the soul. And the solution, of course, is recognizing the self, huh? which if you hang out in the void long enough, the self will reveal itself. And the, the criterion is you have to enter the void completely. You have to die completely. You have to throw yourself on the mercy of what appears to be an uncaring, unforgiving, impersonal universe. Trusting that God will save you. And what happens? You realize that you are God. <laughs> In a way, huh? as it were. Not exactly, but then that's the topic of another video. Aham <laughs> Brahmasmi, Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti, Aum Aum Namah. Shivaya.